So introduce yourself to our lovely audience. I'm Adrian Cardenas, Adrian Cardenas Rubio. Can't forget my mother's last name. Um, I'm a writer director, born and raised in Miami, Florida. I did my undergrad and grad school in NYU at Tisch. And prior go to Violets. that, yep, go Violets. <laughs> and prior to that, in a past life, I uh, played professional baseball. You're listening to Miami Film Labs, Who Call 305. Who Call 305, making a living as a filmmaker. So, you know, we have to start there. What came first, <laughs> baseball or filmmaking? Actually, pian- piano came first. Wow, yeah, you've yeah, done yeah. all of the I things. Have, I have the, <laughs> piano came first. I have very atypical Cuban parents in that they're vegetarians and they don't know anything about sports. <laughs> uh, so my, my dad was one who, my mom and dad, they were people who... They never told me, hey, you have to go play baseball. I never had that father figure who was like, let's go play catch, right? They were very tough on me, but with stuff like music, right? And so when I was young, their their dream was for me to go to Juilliard. So they put me in piano since I was three years old, before baseball, before music, before anything. I have a three-year-old. I cannot imagine him sitting yeah. to learn a piano. They like, had a lot does... of patience because it was just banging on <laughs> keys and, you know, a lot of Mary had a little lamb. And, but they, I mean, they were lovely and they are still. Um but yeah, that was that was what I started doing. Contrary to anyone who's seen your film. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But then Spoiler. they yeah, and then they started, I think eventually they put me in baseball to keep family ties. I had an uncle who was, you know, he had kids my age. And again, to keep the family close, they put me in baseball and you know, I quickly excelled. And and what I love my parents, I mean, I love them for so many reasons, but one of the things that I love about them was when they saw that I had a talent for sports, like rather than sort of push me away, they they sort of like leaned all in and then started learning about sports and, you know, fostering that 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 desire to play and, and desire to excel. So, yeah. so, so when did the filmmaking bug hit you? I, I mean, I grew up, so although they, they like exposed me to baseball and really helped me, it was a household of creatives for the most part, right? Like it was either always watching movies, dancing around, making plays. There's, you know, you know, through in an orderly fashion, I had hundreds of hours of old home videos. That was because my dad was always with a camera and so was my mom. Um, And then with music as well, right? So it was just like a household that that was instilled at an early age. And I think over time, especially when I started playing baseball and had to sort of dedicate my entire life to that, I think, I think it started weighing on me that I wasn't able to, you know, I didn't have these outlets anymore, right? I had to dedicate my whole time to baseball and eventually, you know, I knew I had to choose one over the other. Well, I mean, I don't think you have to choose one over the other. It's just baseball is inherently a short-ish career. It was, was, yeah. There's always this idea of like, I have to figure out what's going to come after that. No. Or like there was always like, I just like, art has to be a part of it one way or another. No, I think, I think, I mean, obviously, I got drafted when I was 18. I I loved the game, so I was excited to play. I wasn't thinking about, you know, what am I going to do after, at least in the onset, right? I I mean, it was something I always wanted to do. I I loved baseball. But I just think over time, at that level, you know, it was dedicating my entire life to that. You know, it was hours and hours and hours trying to perfect that craft. And I think that's when it really, over time, just started to weigh on me that, hey, there's these other things that I used to sort of take for granted that I'd re- I didn't really realize were a huge part of who I am and a huge part of my identity that I'm not getting to sort of explore and, and mess around with. So I think once I started figuring that out, I started trying to balance both worlds. But, you know, filmmaking is you have to dedicate if you want to be if you want to be successful at it, you got to dedicate just as much time. And so at some point I felt that the time in baseball was sort of taking me away from what I really wanted to be doing, even though, you know, in theory, I could have been playing still, you know, it's a short, like you said, short careers for sure. But I stopped playing at 25. You know, I could have kept on presumably playing for at least five, 10 more years. Um, but yeah, it was it was weighing on me. I, I wanted to I wanted to jump in there and I knew, you know, I knew I had some catching up to do. So um, I balanced both for a while. I was at at school at NYU while also playing baseball professionally that for the, for two years insane. in the off seasons. <laughs> I was uh, I was a student at NYU and then 
during season, I was playing baseball. My final year, when I reached the majors with the Cubs, I was, you know, I was Skyping for my midterms and finals, studying on the plane. You know, it was a, it was a wild experience. <laughs> what did your, were your coaches uh, supportive I, or like, were they like, get they off were the computer? They're okay. I think they knew that I was kind of this odd, this odd person, <laughs> you know, and they just let me be. I think in large part, cause I owned it. I think earlier on, you know, I, I was at 18, I was just scared to, you know, the clubhouse has its culture. And if you're not sort of confident in the way that you present yourself, which, you know, I'm 18 years old and only child, not used to, you know, I'm not your typical like <laughs> baseball player in that sense. So, you know, I'd pick up a book, let's say in a thick book and they'd pass by a veteran would pass by me like, what, what are you reading? The encyclopedia, you know, and, and that just like, I like caved in for, for, for the beginning. But then after, you know, you realize once you sort of own who you are and sort of your interest, they not only respect you, but they appreciate it. And oftentimes, you know, they realize, oh, I have this interest too, or, or sorry, I realized, you know, there's so many other people, so many other like-minded, brilliant, um, creative athletes out there that, that it's just a matter of, 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 I don't know, owning, owning what you want and these other passions of yours. And, you know, they accepted me just like, just like anybody else. That's yeah. awesome. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is the idea that there are <laughs> creatives and then there's other people. And I'm like, that's just not true. Mm -mm. I mean, everyone's creative, whether or not you like, that's how you make your living is a completely different thing. Yeah. But like yeah, there's yeah. creativity in putting them out Anything. on the moon. There's creativity in baseball. There's like, that's, that's not a different subset of people. I mean, We're all creatives. Some, yeah. yeah, some of the most creative people I met are baseball players, you know, not necessarily in a creative field per se, but I mean, they're, they're brilliant and creative. And, and I pull a lot of material there. I mean, I'm working for the first time. I'm now like tapping into that part of my life. Um, uh, I'm co-writing a, a baseball script. I call it a baseball script in quotes. It's not really about baseball, but there's a lot of baseball in it. Nice. But it's with a dear friend of mine. I never thought I'd be writing about it. And and he's just like opened me up to that part of m my life. And, and, and I'm accessing memories and, and, and thoughts that I didn't even know I had that were lodged in there. But it's been so much fun. I think I've I've been able to fall in love with the game and, and those people all over again. You know, 15 is therapy. years later. I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. It can be therapy, that's for sure. So when did you decide that film was the art form you're gonna pursue? I mean, you were presumably in music when you were a kid. When a, did the the movie bug hit you? I so undergrad I studied creative writing and philosophy and I thought, oh I'm I wanna be a novelist and that's what I want to do. And I had published a few articles and I thought that was sort of the route I was going to, I was going to go in. And then I think when it was time to go to grad school, I was deciding, I, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. Right. And I was deciding, okay, I'm going to do something creative. It's either going to be an MFA in creative writing or something with philosophy or, or filmmaking. Right. That was, that was also a choice. And I just think I thought, I'm an only child. I'm like used to being by myself. But now that I'm not playing baseball, there was this other part of me, which is incredibly collaborative. I love being around people. I love collaborating with people. I mean, I can't double up on on solitude by being a novelist. <laughs> right? I'm already alone as it is so much. Like I don't want the idea of telling stories or like gathering a, a, a group of people or a team to to, you know, tell a story was was something that was very exciting and oddly enough reminded me of baseball a lot in 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 the best ways right um even even better because here we are like brilliant men and women actors of all ages you know it's, i ultimately decided okay i, th I think i want to try this out and then i went to grad school for that and just absolutely fell in love and then also you know the most important part of filmmaking for me is the script writing phase so i still find that that time to be alone. You and, get the best of yeah, both worlds. I get the yeah. best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. Was NYU worth the price tag? <laughs> it, it depends. <laughs> Someone who also hard has those questions. Yeah. Well, I questions. am also an NYU alum, although I only yeah. did undergrad. No, no, I did no. uh, cinema studies. Yeah, not I doubled production. up on the tuition. <laughs> yeah, you're just it's that's. I mean, <laughs> thankfully because of baseball, I'm no, to I have know, something. I know. <laughs> thankfully because of baseball, I had I had some scholarship money, and you know I, I was fortunate enough to 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 earn some scholarships there in school. But I don't know. I think. I think you definitely don't need to go to film school um, if you want to make films. 
However, for me personally, I wanted to be, I, I could afford to, and I wanted to be in this environment that just allowed me to get messy and explore and be surrounded by by incredible talent. You know, I that's something that I guess, like playing baseball professionally really, I was always hyper aware of the fact that like being surrounded by people who are better than you athletically makes you step up your game. And I felt like school was gonna be that for me. And it definitely was, I mean, I collaborate with so many people now who are, you know, who I met at the program. And I mean, you know, if I need letters of recommendation, I'm going to my professors. If, you know, it was, it was just a beautiful experience. Uh, but, you know, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to justify, but that, that really is the best part of it. You know, that uh, it was for me anyway. Yeah. I mean, I loved my time at NYU. I yeah. did like all the years I spent paying off those loans, but. And you paid them with, off already? Yeah. I bet. Wow. Yeah. I lived at home, paid off 100K I in five years. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I, you can't freelance with that kind of debt. You just can't. You can't. You um, can't. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. That's so I made sure I got rid of it and it let me, you know. Yeah. not have to take really, really crummy jobs and yeah. that kind of stuff. And I never would have started a nonprofit or whatever if I still had those loans. So yeah, um, if you are going to take out all those loans to go to film school, definitely uh, have a plan to pay them off. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think they're doing a great job now of sort of s bridging that, you know, academic world with the real world. I know there's a big push for that. We have like a production lab there that sort of serves as an incubator for, for people, you know, about to graduate, wanting to start getting paid to do it. You know, I say that being someone who still hasn't gotten paid to write and direct, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, there, there, is a, there is a lot of that. And, um, and yeah, like I said, it was, it was a beautiful experience being surrounded by, by that community is, is really special. I mean, I think I'll always, I mean, I lived my, my formative years were in New York you know, in particular right there in, in Washington Square Park and NYU. So I, you know, I, it's a, it's a special place for me. Right. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. agree. So what brought you back to Miami? The pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, people was like, oh, you're part of, they don't know me. They're like, oh, you're part of that New York exodus here in Miami. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I'm born and raised here. Okay. I just came back. Um, I just came back eventually, but I, a few things, the pandemic was definitely one of them. I had a place here. I was my family was here. My mom's a nurse. My dad was a physical therapist at the time. He's retired now. But I kind of just wanted to be close to home. I wanted space. You know, New York was getting hit hard and I was in a 400 square foot studio. You know, the idea of like not being able to leave or or just like I, I you know, I it was good for my health to come back. And then and then I just realized also I had graduated already. So there was part of me that was like, you know, even in my time at NYU, my stories weren't, you know, I think maybe I, I shot one, I did a short, like our first short is shot on 16 millimeter. It's a four minute silent film. And I did it in New York. But other than that, all the other projects I've done have never been in New York. And it's just a hard thing for me to, I just can't tell stories in New York. It's just not, it's not in me. It's not sort of the thing that I do. So. You know, there's just this fight and everyone sort of tells you, you got to be in New York or L.A., you got to be in New York or L.A. And then I think one of the beautiful things, if we can talk like this, to come out of the pandemic is a lot of us, filmmakers in particular, I think, I mean, everyone really, but we started realizing or sort of questioning that, right? You know, do you have to be in New York to make movies? Do you have to be in L.A. to make movies? Um and I took that to heart, you know, I, I came to Miami and I mean, we've met and I talked to you about this, just the importance of sort of like building this community or wanting to immerse myself in, in this Miami filmmaking community, which, you know, it, it was just a matter of getting in there and realizing how rich it is, how beautiful it is, you know, um, and, and filled with just absolute talent, you know, that, that we just, it's, it's, perfect i just think we we sort of serve as this bridge you know between the u.s and the caribbean and south america and our stories you know miami's like a melting pot for all that and i think there's some really interesting stuff that's coming out and for me it's just like i want to be a part of this you know and then also all the stories that i'm that i'm wrestling with sort of 
operate in in this space. Yeah, with I the think. exception of the baseball one, but <laughs> <laughs> all the other ones, yeah. We'll still take credit for it. Uh, but yeah, I think <laughs> Absolutely, you should. We all I should. I think yeah. it, it was coming before the pandemic, this idea of people want to live in their lives the way they want, not be dictated by where industry and other things yeah. are. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the pandemic made it super clear going, why can't I, why do I have to live in these places? Why can't we do? And with the, you know, how much technology has democratized all of this, like, yeah. There's, it's cheaper, easier, faster. Why do I have to be in New York and LA? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's funny because you think you're doing something so new and you're coming, or so, you know, out of the ordinary when you're coming to Miami back home to try to make films. And then you realize some of the greatest filmmakers are already doing that. Like Richard Linklater, I think, for example, makes most of his movies in Texas, lives in Texas. You know, he's making brilliant stuff, right? Like, why yeah. can't why can't that be us? You our know? last conversation uh, for our film craft series with Full Lord was the same thing with Danny McBride. Danny McBride's like, I'm not in living North Carolina, in North Carolina, right? Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, I saw a podcast of his on, on Smart Listen. Yeah, he talks like, about that. Why yeah. not? And it's also part of our conversation with Phil was <laughs> Danny's whole uh, idea is if all of the stories come from two places, that changes the stories that we tell. The, Absolutely, yeah, that's what the I mean. stories need to come from lots of different places and show lots of different experiences. So choosing to not um, have your work kind of funneled through these lenses makes the projects richer. And I Absolutely. think that's why all these projects coming out of Miami have been so great lately because yeah. we're not letting anyone else tell us people will like that or not like that. Like this is the story that speaks to me and this is what I want to do and that's what I'm going to do. This episode is sponsored by Unique Producer Service is South Florida's premier grip and lighting house. In business over 50 years, they have the experience to help you along the way, whether this is your first rental or your hundredth. If you need to come test out lights before you shoot, need equipment delivered, or you need a full crew, Unique has got you covered. You can visit their website at uniqueproducers.com or call them at 305-681-7627. Nestled between Miami and the Florida Keys lies an enchanted and tranquil estate. Palm Lodge House and Tropical Garden is a historic two-acre property from 1912. Its old Florida-inspired decor is intended to transport you back over 100 years with old world charm everywhere you look. The spacious two-story, three-bedroom house features an expansive porch, a high-ceiling foyer, a grand piano, and an outdoor living room, and is surrounded by lush tropical gardens with seashell walkways throughout. And it is the perfect place for your next shoot or event. Even just, yeah, just in, in terms of casting, in terms of writing, like, you know, I write, all, all my stories are, I mean, we speak a different language here, right? It's like English and Spanish, right? It's not even, I, know, I know there's a lot of, you Bro. know, there's a <laughs> lot of memes around that stuff, but, but there's also some beautiful experiences that come from that, right? Like, you know, my grandma speaking to me in Spanish or saying something and then me responding to my parents in English. There's just, there's stuff there. Like you said, it's just more rich. And if these stories were being told and, you know, are funneled through through the, these conventional avenues, um, there's a greater chance that they can, you know, that these nuances can be left out, right? And that's that's something that's so special, I think, here, um, which, which I'm excited about. Also, you know, someone like me, white complexion, light eyes, you know, I was a blonde hair, blue eyed baby speaking Spanish the whole time. I didn't know English, right? Until I was, you know, seven, eight years old. So just, it just that's, you know, I think it's a beautiful experience just seeing the diversity, you know, real diversity and real inclusion here in Miami. And, and I, I, like I said, I can't be happier to be here. And of course I miss New York. I, I try to go back there all the time. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think we're doing some great things here. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you haven't actually made a living yet as a writer director. So how are you making a living these days? Baseball, baseball has been very, very good to me. <laughs> as <laughs> who said that? I forget. Was it Sammy Sosa or somebody? Anyway, um, no. I look. I was fortunate enough. Full transparency. I was fortunate enough to get drafted in the first round. It was in large part why I decided to to leave um, or to bypass college when I was eighteen years old. Got offered a boatload of money to go play professionally, and I love you know I loved baseball, so you know why not, right? I'm I didn't come from money, so I wasn't going to have this opportunity again. I was hyper aware of that. You know what what greater chance to to sort of be able to get paid doing what you love, right? And at that time, baseball was definitely my my real true love. Um, I was fortunate enough to to like I said, invest it, have very 
wonderful people around me that prevented me from splurging and, and buying cars or just doing stupid things with my money. Um, so that really helped carry me, for example, helped me pay for, for college, for undergrad and grad school at NYU. You know, so now I have no debt. You know, I, I feel like it's important to say these things because I don't want to be that person that says, oh, leave everything or do this when, you know, I'm in a different position financially, potentially than than other people. Um, but, you know, it's definitely I definitely need to make money at some <laughs> point. Um, and, and I'm able to survive off the money that I had. You know, I made some investments that sort of yield passive income for me. But, you know, I might make three, four thousand dollars a month. And that's good enough right now to survive, you know, off odd jobs. Right. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, I teach. So I teach at UM. I teach intro to screenwriting and I've been doing that. I started at Montclair University in New Jersey and now I'm at, um, at UM, yeah, teaching intro to screenwriting. So that also generates some sort of income, but you know, ideally I want to be writing and directing for money and that's, you know, we all would want to be doing that, but, but that's, <laughs> that I mean, that's, the that's, that's, that's the dream, right? But you've so. had the films that you have, the shorts you've made have had quite successful runs at film festivals. Yeah, and, things, and, yeah. and a lot of them fortunately have been funded, uh, you know, by Oolite or by just certain other grants that I've gotten. And, and that's been, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I mean, it, it sucks to have to spend so much money on, on, on shorts or features, you know, and, and not be able to get paid. I mean, it's, it's, un, it's an unfortunate reality of our, of our industry, but, you know, I'm a big believer in just continuing to do the work, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I don't know, is, is the question, how do I get paid? I, cause I don't know. No, yet. I think it's the idea <laughs> But of, just my, my situation on that is. Yeah. yeah. It's how I think it's important for people to understand, like, the people making great shorts may or may not be making a living from filmmaking. And then there's people who make a living doing commercial and stuff like that and don't always have the bandwidth to then do their stuff. I don't think how you make your living, it, it's important for us to be more transparent so yeah. that it's easier for people to understand what it actually takes to make a living here, especially in Miami, yeah. where, you know, you might be doing films on the side or it might be your full time job or you might be doing commercials, like understanding what this ecosystem looks like I think is really important so you know we all feel less shitty when um, we're yeah. not making yeah. our living yeah. exclusively from the kind of work we want to be doing yeah for, and, and for me teaching has been you know I never thought I'd I'd be teaching right and then I, I got the opportunity that the chair of NYU and this is like I said you know how do you justify grad school costs this is one real tangible way, right? Like I got this job, I got the job at Montclair State University teaching intro to screenwriting because the chair of NYU, who she became the chair of the program my first year. So she was, you know, we were her babies, right? And uh, we had established a really good relationship during my time there. And she reached out just out at random, say, hey, there's this job opening you know, if you ever have any interest in teaching at a place like NYU or whatever, you need to start somewhere. I could put in a good word for you. You know, I think you'd, I think you'd do a good job. <clears throat> at that point, I didn't even know if I wanted to go up there because, you know, pay was shit, right? <laughs> like, you want to talk about transparency? It was like, it cost me money to go there and teach. It was $5,000 for the semester. That's what I was going to pay, $5,000 for the semester. And I had to go. The semester's what, three, four months? Four months, yeah. yeah, four months. You had to go live in New York. Go, <laughs> go buy, you know, <laughs> I like rented my friend's apartment with subletting, you know, $1,200 a month there, you know, which $1,200 <laughs> you can't do anywhere. I was in Sunset Park, 1200 bucks. That's not a thing anymore um you know tw yeah 1200 bucks a month it, like i said it cost me and then commuting to new jersey every you know when i was teaching it was only once a week but still you know um it cost me money to go there but i thought it was worth it and and through that um that experience i landed the job here teaching at at um and you know at first and i have this this is like an issue for me. Like at first I'm just, oh, this is all I want to be. All I want to be doing is writing and directing. I don't want to do anything else. Right. Because anything else is taken away from my writing and directing and it's bullshit really, you know? Um, and, and teaching allowed me to realize that like really reinforce that because I got the most writing I've ever gotten done was while I was teaching intro to screenwriting. Um, 
And I think the I advanced the most on my projects while I was teaching intro to screenwriting, right? And that was ironic for me because here I was dedicating a lot of time to something other than, you know, my own projects, but I was, ex I was excelling more, you know, in my projects, which I made a connection and I'll circle back. But like with baseball, the most successful I ever was in my career playing baseball was when I was balancing school and baseball, right? Not when I was diabolically dedicated to one thing and one thing only, right? And and that was important for me. Not everyone's like that. And some people need to be obsessive with that one particular thing. But for me personally, it was incredibly helpful. For example, like thinking, you know, about structure, right? And then realizing you have to articulate your ideas to 18, 19 year olds who are like itching to not pay attention to you, right? Like that's a special skill that I definitely didn't have. And, you know, just the pressure of like, hey, you have to do it. And there's people that are relying on you to, you know, convey certain information really made me like study up, so to speak. Right. It was almost like I was in school all over again. I was teaching, but I was in school all over again. <laughs> but I think more than the studying up, it's like you sometimes don't realize how much you know until you have to explain it to someone yeah. else. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then like as you take it back to you with your writing going like, oh, I just taught my oh, kids this thing and I'm doing the complete well, opposite that, of my that, script. That was, the, that was the best thing, yeah. right? And then also having to articulate 18, 19 year olds for the most part, a lot of them don't have any, you know, writing backgrounds or filmmaking backgrounds. So they're coming to me with ideas that, you know, are very raw or fresh and, and you know, obviously you can't just say, oh, this sucks or this is bad. You have to learn how to, you know, really articulate why it's not working or maybe suggest how it can be better. And those are skills that, again, I didn't really have and one that I was sort of just learning on the fly. But it was it was a beautiful experience just trying to be able to pinpoint what wasn't working in a script. Right. But in a script that, you know, you read when you read more polished scripts, it's sort of easier, ironically, easier to pinpoint what's not working. Right. Because usually a lot of things are working. So the thing that isn't sticks out. But, you know, someone who's never done it. Pretty much everything is not working. You just have working. to find out what is working. Right? Exactly. It's like you find this one sentence that they write or this one, you know, one image that they create that really can serve as a jumping point to 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 tell a beautiful story. Right. Or or the scene that they crafted really has a beginning, middle and end. And it's incredibly effective and and conveying a clear point of view. You know, those are things that that I became better at pinpointing while I was teaching. And then, like you said, you know, then you you go back and, and sort of review your own stuff and you're like, oh, why, you know, here I was like <laughs> doing exactly the opposite of, of what I was teaching. You're able to, you're able to like catch those mistakes a lot quicker and, and just like move forward with the process a bit, a bit more. Um, I also think that I established a better routine while teaching, right? Because I had a lot more free time to do my own things. And then, you know, you realize I had a professor now that, that you're, you're pregnant three months in and this is relevant, but, uh, <laughs> But a professor of mine always used to tell me she got most of her work done when she had a kid. And it was because, you know, she knew she had a certain window when that kid was going to go to school or whatever to get work done. And she knew if if that window passed and she didn't do work, that's it. Her day was done. Right. So she treated that that space very, or those hours very sacredly. And I think I'm getting to a place where I'm doing that as well, right? And I don't know about you, but I always have my friends who always make fun of me, like, ah, you got a real job. They're like, yo, you're busy today. What are you doing, you know? <laughs> and it's hard to sort of put your foot down and be like, no, this is, you know, this is my work, right? And uh, even if I'm not getting paid for it, right? This, yeah. this is my work and I need to chip away at it and I need to do it every day. Um, and yeah, again, it's going to get me. I'm working towards something <laughs> towards and like that, yeah. a paycheck isn't the, especially if you're an artist and a filmmaker, like you, you got to do what you do for the thing, yeah. not necessarily for the paycheck. Although obviously we all need paychecks me, and yeah, like, absolutely. that's the ultimate <laughs> goal, but like the work itself is important and to be disciplined enough to do that is one of the biggest skills you need to learn, especially if you're going to be a freelancer and do I, your own thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in my in my mind, the only way to do it. I mean, you have to put in the time day in and day out. Right. I tell my students all the time because they're like, um, you know, a lot of times they go into it wanting, you know, they treat it as therapy and writing can be therapeutic. But I always say writing can be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. Right. It's it's work. Right. And you have to 
you have to treat it as such, right? And and that doesn't mean, I think work has this negative connotation all the time because oftentimes it feels like work, the things that we do. But if this is something you love doing, you know, I I say it's work, but it's just, it just feels great. You know, it's work that I like. Yeah, I agree. Um, work needs to lose the negative lose that connotation. Negative connotation yeah. But you're still doing it at times when you might not want to be doing it or you want to be doing something else, right? I That's been a... A hard thing, not a hard thing, but a thing that I'm I'm sort of honing in on now, right? Like with baseball is easy. Like I was obsessed. Like I, you know, spent so many hours doing what I did. Um, and it was just easier. It was a huge organization. I was getting paid for it. Sort of my schedule was set. It was easy to just work really hard at that. And with this, it's just very, you know, it's very different. A, I set my own hours, but also you know, yeah, no one's telling me what to do. And, and that's, that can be tricky and, and crippling at times. Um, Not at times, most of the most time. Of the time. Because most you, of the time. Yeah. It's, uh, it's up to you. There's no one saying, you know, you've met your goals today. You yeah. set your goals, you figure yeah. out what you're doing and it's, it's all on you and it's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's next for you? What's next for me? Well, I'm working, I'm working on three projects right now. Three, three, three features that are sort of, and I didn't, you know, some people work on one feature, some people work on multiple projects. Never work on just one project. On just one, never says work the on. producer. I I just, you never know <laughs> no, no, what, right. yeah, yeah. what, what's going to hit with people, what the people, like, yeah. no, 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 unless you're, right. you're independently wealthy and are financing yeah, and your own films, it. like, you yeah. need to have options. So, Absolutely. like, if an opportunity comes up, you know, you can be like... He, here are the many things you can choose from. Yeah, yeah. I I first started writing this story called El Cuento de la Ballena. It, you know, I shot my thesis in Cuba, in this town 12 hours east of Havana. Um, in, yeah, it's called Hibara. And anyway, I was working on a feature based on that. And there was a whale involved. And, you know, again, young, naive grad school student having no idea of like what it takes to make a whale on camera <laughs> ma make a movie like <laughs> even that like i i knew i knew that it would cost money you know it, the whale's dead you know that there's i have that producer hat that i can put on but even still i was just naive in that you know it's a first time you know you're asking this to be a first time a feature first time writer director and you're asking for legitimate money you know let's say a million dollars which was i think what the budget was sitting and probably more than that like 1.5 million dollars for a first time feature writer director first time writer director to go shoot in cuba which you know what's the blueprint for that right um in i mean this is sad but it's true in in a foreign language right not in english um, you know, pretty art house, right? Like, good luck. <laughs> like, good luck trying to find that money, right? And these are things that in film school, you're sort of coddled in a way that you don't pay attention to that, right? Because they're just like, just work, work, work. And 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 it's that's what you study producing. And, Our producing and, classes were not like that. We, we had producing classes. If you take producing classes, <laughs> they they are the ones that you know knock some sense into you, right? And and rightfully so. And I think, of course, you need to write what what you want to write. You just need to, you know, understand the difficulties if you're writing, you know, X and expecting, you know, and expecting Y. So it it was pretty successful. the 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 feature has like gotten some buzz and has gotten some attraction. But still, again, it's it's a hard thing to get money for to go shoot in Cuba, and and that landscape is very, you know, very difficult to try to tackle, right? Especially now. Um, and for a long while there, I was just like, well, no, this is going to be my first feature. Right. And then one day I just had like this heart to heart. I was like, look, are you a writer or not? Right. If you're a writer, you write. Right. And if you're not making this right and you feel like it's at a good place, write something else. Right. Prove to yourself that you can write something else. Uh, so I started writing. That's when I came back here right around the time I came back here and I was at home and I hadn't written and directed something in a while. And I like discovered all these old home videos that I started digitizing. And I was like, you know what? I, I kind of want to work on this. I want to challenge myself to write this story starring my mom, dad, and parents, you know, my, my parents and my grandparents. And 
uh, my best friend. You know, I just wanted, there's just something here that I want to, that I want to do. And then, so I started writing. It's in an early fashion. You know the short. Um, I think that's how we met, essentially, right? Through that, through that short. But again, I won't talk much about the short unless you have any questions, but really that short. Other than if you see it anywhere, you should go run and see it because it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but but that short allowed me to develop another feature, right? I was like, you know, the material that was there, I thought was was interesting, rich material that I felt I wasn't done exploring yet. And I decided to turn it into a feature, right? Uh, pretty easily because I'd spent so much time with, with that story and those characters. And so I knew them very well. Um, and so that's the that's the second feature that I'm working on right now. And I have a pretty advanced draft of that. And I'm now just really getting to the point where the script is ready, you know, to be shown, hopefully soon, you know, packaged together and sent off to people and trying to get money for that. I think that can be that can be my first feature. Again, it's, it's realistic. Yeah. I think there's a proof of concept um, and we don't talk about this much, but it, it makes sense why someone might you know, give you money to do that. Yes, it's a first time writer director, but it's material that I know very well. There's a proof of concept that's done okay. And the scale is manageable. The scale, the scale is manageable, right? I, it, the budget sits anywhere from half a million to a million dollars, you know. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that'll, that'll, you know, gain some traction soon. And that's my goal to try to get a feature off the ground this year, right? Or at least get, I, at least get financing <laughs> for, for one. Um, and then the, I'm co-writing that baseball script that, that sort of just, I mean, it's not something I came up with. It was, it's kind of funny the way it works. I have this friend of brilliant friend now, like one of my closest friends, but at the time, I was friends with one of his friends, right? Like we had a mutual friend in common, this guy named Alex, and we went to NYU together for undergrad. And then he went on to go do an MFA in poetry at Columbia and met this guy, Michael, who I'm co-writing with. But Michael never played baseball. He played baseball, I think, up to his sophomore year. And then he was kicked off the team. <laughs> Not kicked off the team, but didn't make the cut. Um, but baseball, he has these like strong ties to baseball in his family. And he knows so much more about baseball than I do about the history of it, like what he finds beautiful about it. I mean, he, he really made me fall in love with baseball all over again, but he was writing some baseball stuff, like very lyrical. Again, he's a poet, lyrical poet. And he was writing, you know, he was writing these poems or these prose poems sort of on baseball or that they had baseball in it. And so my buddy Alex read it and was like, Hey, I have this friend who like played professional baseball. You should share your work. Just, to serve as like a consultant sort of, right? Mm -hmm. To sort of like fact check your fact check your work. <laughs> and he's like, oh sure, I'd love to, you know, put me in touch. And so he sends me this email asking, you know, for me to read his stuff. And I, you know, I've had people reach out and say, hey, would you mind reading this? And I usually do, I send feedback and then that's it. Nothing ever comes out of it. And I just read his stuff and I absolutely loved it. You know, I I like fell in love with the with the material. The way he talked about baseball was I felt very interesting and and not and and nuanced and not really talked about in the way like you know the baseball movies we see or the sports movies that we see don't really address the things he was talking about and that for me was really exciting <clears throat> so I spent I spent so much time editing his stuff right just cuz <laughs> I was like I love this stuff it was just for fun and I I sent back you know my notes and he really enjoyed my notes so we like established this like back and forth and then eventually I pitched him this idea of you know, writing a script based on some of his characters. And he, you know, he loved it. And that was maybe about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And now we have a, a, a pretty advanced draft. We're now working on a, another draft. And the, the budget for that one is higher. You know, it, it's tricky, right? Because obviously that can be an easier, you know, I want to tie this to, you know, your question on like how to make a living, right? You got to be I get it. For a long while there, I was just like, I just want to write and direct and people are going to give me money. But it just doesn't work that way. And it's not even that, even if it did work that way, I think there's a benefit to really understanding the mechanics of, of, of the machine, so to speak, and really trying to, I don't know, get just to be, you know, to be, I, know, I, was, I was thinking of the right word, but just... 
just to be very proactive with how you decide to position your film and how it makes sense to position it. And just right? don't make your life harder. Like, if you've never done a movie, you're making a sci-fi epic. Like, it's just, it's a big hurdle to cross. Like, it's yeah. just harder. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. like, being realistic and doing the thing that you know you can do well always is going to make getting that next one that's a little more challenging, yeah. you yeah. know, easier to do. Yeah, and I, I resisted telling baseball stories or, you know, or just really writing about that because in my mind I was like, oh, well, it's just not that interesting. Who cares? Like I left, like I left the game in part because I didn't just like find that world that interesting anymore. But again, it's total bullshit, right? Like if you, and this is part of the whole writing thing, right? Like if you're a writer, that's sort of your job to find the interesting parts in what people don't think is interesting right and and um michael my co-writer sort of reminded me of that and and yeah it's been fun thinking about sure the budget is let's say 10 15 million dollars for a first time writer director probably impossible to get but also maybe not not. unreasonable for a film And, and, and you know how many writer directors writing a baseball movie played professional baseball, right? Like, you know, you start understanding, oh, maybe there is an angle in which I can get financing for this film, right? I I was really close friends with the reporters in Chicago or just reporters in general, better friends with them than a lot of the players, to be <laughs> honest. <clears throat> a lot of those contacts are, are important. Like, there's a way to, to market it, to present it. There's like so much free advertising, right? Like things like that, that I used to think, oh, this is going to cheapen the project thinking about that. But again, that's just like naive talk, right? And it it not only gives you a, a clear picture as to how you can actually get this movie made, but it also makes you think of things in a way that you haven't, which is always so crucial to the writing and important to the writing, right? So I don't know. Yeah. So that's what I'm working on. I love it. So <laughs> anyone who wants to support any of these many things, yeah, give me money, how give do me they money. find you online? <laughs> um, I... I'm on Instagram, really. That's pretty much the only thing I'm on. I I got rid of everything else. But um, yeah, Instagram, really, or my email or through you or, you know, (laughs) my number or whatever. (laughs) I'm one of those like old school people in that like, whatever, here's my number. Like, call me or text me. What's your website? Oh, yeah, I do have a website. I forgot about that. I'm actually updating the real. But um, first and last name, adriancardenas.com. Fabulous. Yeah, Go find easy. him. Yeah. Support him. Yeah. Do all the things. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It was awesome. Yep. This episode is a production of Miami Film Lab, a nonprofit production company supporting local filmmakers as they work to make a living telling Miami stories. It was produced by Joe Terman and myself, Jen Orta Castellanos, and was recorded at Unicorn Fire Studios. Jed Royer at Royer Design made our logos. Our music is by Ola Hai. You can subscribe to Crew Call 305 on your preferred podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, leave a comment or review. If you want to support our work, you can make a tax-deductible donation at miamifilmlab.org. Thanks so much for listening.